Hello and welcome to the Build a Soil YouTube series. This is season three. We're on episode five. Today, we're honoring a legend. Clackamas Coot basically helped me start the company, whether he knew it or not at the time. And now he's worked right alongside with us, making sure that we honor the original intentions. And he's also taught me a ton about sourcing ingredients, composts, and everything in between. So along with sharing all of our stuff with you, making a coots-based soil, like our living organic soil recipes. I wanna do one better. I wanna make it just like Coot would make it. I wanna explain where the recipe came from, why it's so important, and also the ingredients that are in it, and really do Coot an honor right here on this episode by making it from scratch using all worm castings just like he was. So Coot, if you're watching, we really appreciate everything you've done for Build a Soil. And I think that running your genetics in your soil recipe made the Build a Soil way is gonna be a really good way to put a highlight on our season three 10 by 10 series. So to get started, one of the things that you should know before I talk about the recipe is Coot does this in a special way and nobody does it the same as he does. He makes his own worm castings from scratch and then he adds special ingredients throughout that process so that when he gets to the soil mixing phase, he's essentially just using his worm castings and not adding all the ingredients that we're gonna add. You can still add some of them, but the idea would be to have the worms pre-work all of this into the compost and then you'd make the soil from it. That being said, we've tested it a number of different ways and Coot agrees, mixing this with good castings at this ratio works really, really well. So if you're watching at home and you wanna go a step further, you can set up a worm bin. And the way that he's done it in the past is like a 100 gallon smart pot. He's even recommended those dumpster bags that waste management drops off that like fold out and you could fill it with compost and get worms in it. But he makes a thermal fill it compost and then he adds worms to it later once it cools down and he uses barley straw. And that is one of the base ingredients that he adds in there for a lot of the carbon. And then he adds a whole bunch of greens. And so you can look up that recipe. Comfrey is, a, uh, is the greens that a lot of people use. Essentially, we need to make a compost. Then he adds a few ingredients. Now, over the years, they've evolved a little bit. I wanna grab the kit and show you, and I'll talk about the ingredients so that at least you know where I'm coming from. And just Google Clackamas Coot Soil Recipe, and you'll find a ton of information about this soil recipe in particular. And it's very simple, so we can talk about every ingredient. And I think one of the things that's neat is anywhere in the world, no matter where you live, if you understand each ingredient, you can duplicate this recipe. You don't have to buy anything from Build a Soil. And that's a big part of the do-it-yourself philosophy. So let's talk about it. I've got the kit here, which we're gonna make available to you. You can get all of this delivered to your home, or you can go source all of it individually. The bulk of what you see here is the base. We have the aeration is one part, and it's a three-part recipe. We have the peat moss, which is the second part, and we have all of the, the worm castings, which is the third part. They're all equal parts by volume, not by weight. And so what I mean by that is rice holes, one cubic foot, a lot lighter weight than one cubic foot of worm castings. And when you find these old school recipes, a lot of times you'll see people say 40 pounds of worm castings. Like, well, is that wet, dry? So I like to go by volume when it comes to things that have moisture in them. So that might help you if you're shopping on the market. Some people sell castings by the pound. It's okay as long as it's a fair price, but it can get a little confusing when it comes to moisture content. A cubic foot for, our purposes, we like to say, is about seven and a half gallons, depending if it's wet or dry, fluffed or smashed. The equal parts that we're using to make 18 cubic feet, six cubic feet of aeration, six cubic feet of peat moss, six cubic feet of worm castings. Now, I'm gonna talk about that because there's a few different ways you can break this up. The peat moss, this is a 3.8 cubic foot bale. You'll notice it's in writing here on the bale. You can get these locally. You don't have to buy them from us and this is responsibly harvested from Canada. Some people do use cocoa core for this, but that's not the Coots recipe. He uses peat moss and he's adamant about it. And we really like that as well. So 3.8 cubic feet, you might say, hey, that's not six cubic feet. That's compressed. So don't let it trick you. It's actually more than six cubic feet when you fluff it. But when you fluff it by hand and you measure it, it's about six cubic feet. So that's the number that we've always used, that the guys on the forums have always used. And so we're just making sure we keep the integrity of the recipe. Now on the aeration side, we have two types of aeration. Even though it's one part, we have rice holes. And rice holes is a natural way to aerate that's very lightweight. Normally perlite's used, which is black obsidian rock that's expanded under heat and it's puffed up like popcorn. And it takes a lot of energy to produce. This is more renewable in the sense that we're growing rice for food, it's important. 
And so the waste product becomes a stream that we can use. And the, the rice holes, they don't just break down right away. They're made of silica, kind of like glass, kind of like rocks. And so they last a lot longer. And it's an organic form of it because it's made by plants. And the rice holes are small. You can see what they look like. I'll show you on the tarp when I make the soil. But this adds to the drainage capability of the soil. And it makes it so that it doesn't make really clumpy soil. It makes it so that the roots can go in there, just like perlite would. And that's an important advantage. Now, the reason why we use this particular brand that we bag up and we also sell in its original wrapping, it's a lot bigger bale. They do a lot of heavy metal testing and they do a lot of batch consistency. They make sure that there's no germination of the seeds. And that's really important when it comes to rice holes. You don't want half of them germinating and ruining your soil. Like on a commercial scale, that can cause a huge issue when you're germinating in little tiny cells. So quality of rice holes is important. Next, we have pumice. And we use pumice that is also used for the dental industry and water filtration and the beauty industry. And so it's a really clean material, um, heavy metal tested. It's, it's a great product. It's a three eighths by quarter. And so you'll see the size, but it's you know, three eighths by quarter inch. And they mine it pretty close to here, so freight's not that big of a deal. And it's a great product. But pumice and rice holes is the go-to living soil aeration. If you have perlite and you're like, ah, I have this, I wanna use it. The whole point is to use this soil forever, to keep it around, never throw it away. And in that way, it becomes more sustainable and it becomes better over time. But the perlite would crush and break up and it would float to the top of the soil with watering. This does not do that. The bulk of what we use is pumice the rice holes over years will eventually break down. That's okay, we'll have worms in there, cover crop root, roots, all sorts of ways to keep the soil active, alive, and, and fluffy, if that makes sense, where it's not gonna compress. I like to use a little more pumice than rice holes, just for the long term, knowing some of this will go away, all right? Worm castings, we're using Build-A-Soil worm castings. They're very economic, they test out phenomenally well and balanced, but one of the things I like about the Kooko is they're old school, they're made the right way and they are really nutrient dense. And so instead of just loading this completely with those worm castings, I'm gonna do one bag of it to make it price, like cost effective, load the soil with the nutrients like Clackamas Coot would. And this is a locally made product. So if we just said, hey, all these have to be Co uh, Colorado Worm Company, it would be super heavy, it'd be super expensive and he would run out. So this is a great way for us to give you the best of all the worlds, make a soil that's not overdone right out the gate, give you really good balance because we, we test a lot of this at the lab, we know what it's gonna do. But when you're going locally, I want you to kind of play it by ear a little bit in the sense that Coot recommends one part of worm castings, but he's making his own. This is the most important part to get right. If you just go buy some local castings and they're really salty or something, that could be a problem. That's the one thing you wanna learn about. The great news is it's pretty easy to get really good worm castings nowadays, especially with companies like Colorado Worm Company, the Build-A-Soil castings. Heck, even if you just go get some stuff at the hydro shop and you mix it in and only order one good bag like this, you'll have something similar here where it makes a really good profile. Last, let's get into the additions and then I'm just gonna get out, bust out the tarp, show you my process. We have a few extra bags. This is the Clackamas Coots eight pound nutrient kit. We just made it easy for you. This eight pound nutrient kit mixes into nine cubic feet of soil. Well, we're making 18 cubic feet, so you're gonna have two of these. And you just dump them in. It's already pre-mixed together. This is everything that would be in the Clackamas Coots nutrient kit. Now, normally when you get the Clackamas Coots nutrient kit back in the day, you would go buy three ingredients. You'd buy a kelp meal, a neem cake, and then you would buy a crustacean meal. And that covers a lot of bases there. We could go talk all day about these three ingredients. The kelp, comes from the ocean, has the entire periodic table of elements. It's been used by many civilizations. It has a lot of health benefits to it, has a lot of plant growth hormones for why it grows so fast. A little bit goes a long way. A lot of people would overdo this and you don't need to do that. Half cup per cubic foot or less. Crustacean meal, half cup per cubic foot. And the neem cake, half cup per cubic foot. Now, various ways to switch it up. A lot of people do neem and karanja mixed. It's kind of a extra one up to the recipe. That's what we do. Then last but not least, he eventually started using malted barley seed. It's a pre-sprouted seed. It's super important because of the enzymatic activity. It really kicks off soil production. It's great to feed to worms and it helps break down everything that we're adding into the compost to really make the soil come to life. Enzymes are very, very special. For that reason, we're gonna include it in our Clackamas Coots nutrient we have for a while. So I just wanna explain that in case you've heard it as the neem kelp and crustacean. We have the neem karanja kelp crustacean add malted barley. It's the full Coots recipe at its full evolution. And then on top of that, last but not least, we have the minerals and the biochar. So let's talk about minerals. This mineral mix is 27 pounds. It's for nine cubic feet. And so all in all, we're adding 54 pounds of minerals. And that's four cups per cubic foot. And we're making 18 cubic feet. The original recipe, I've done straight gypsum. 
It was a little bit too much gypsum, but it had a really good turnout. And when I found out that he was really looking for minerals, we started originally using glacial rock dust. Then he came to find that he really, really preferred basalt rock dust for a number of reasons. So to honor that, in here is basalt and gypsum and the oyster shell. And those were the three ingredients. Originally, I think he was using the Steve Solomon three-way lime recipe. And it was like a dolomite lime or an ag lime and the gypsum and one other. And so when you look at it that way, this is kind of that similar effect. You've got gypsum, which is calcium and sulfur. You've got the oyster shell, which is calcium carbonate. And then you've also got the basalt, which is similar to kelp in that it's the entire periodic table of elements. This is a volcanic rock material. And we have the pumice from the volcano. We have the basalt from the volcano. Remineralization is what you see when you think of healthy food places where food grows really well. And so that's what we're mimicking here in this process. That combined, it's that simple. There's just a few amendments, not 15 or 20. There's a few minerals, that's it. And it builds the entire basis of this recipe and it's really long term. And then the final ingredient is biochar. This is our charged biochar. We're adding two gallons to 135 gallons of soil. We're not adding much as far as percentage, but this will add a lot of carbon to it for the long term. It's pre-charged with root wise and a little bit of amino acid to make sure that it gives back to the soil instead of takes from it. There's a, there's a ton of research on biochar. A lot of our customers are adamant about adding biochar and we wanna make sure that that's included. I've got my tarp, which is how we used to do it. I've got a shovel, which you don't really need. I've got a plastic one because I don't wanna tear the tarp and this will make it easy for me to just move stuff around a little bit. A lot of times I'll just do a lot of this by hand. I wanna break up all the clumps. It's a lot of work. And a lot of times people will just start by laying it out Mixing a little, coming back later. Mixing more, coming back later, mixing more, then wetting it all down. And eventually you get a pile that is even moisture, fairly well mixed, and it'll start to warm up a little bit. And every day you can turn it just a little bit, and we'll explain that. The idea is you wanna spread it out kind of thin so you don't have to lift lots of weight in one spot. You can get it thin where it's easy to move around, flip the sides of the tarp. So think about that. Don't just go get like a five by five tarp. It's gonna be off the edges like in no time, okay? So now I've laid the tarp out and I made sure it's oversized. You can come to the edge and then I can grab it and flip the material back on top of itself, kind of mixing it as it falls. So that's one reason I like a tarp. I've done it in these tote bags before, and 18 cubic feet in a tote bag, it gets really hard to get to the bottom in there and accurately mix it. You almost have to take it from one to the other and pour it so it mixes. I think this is the better way for a larger soil volume. I'm gonna grab the peat moss first. Main reason why is this has to all be broken up properly. So I like lasagna it out. So let's get going. I'm gonna cut the peat moss first. There's gonna be a lot of clumps and I'm gonna spend some time breaking it up so I don't have big chunks of peat moss that are hydrophobic. I want it to be all fluffed out. So when I wet it, this really comes together as a mix. So what I'd like to do is just get the bag off of here completely, cut around. And I cut where I leave a little bit on so I can just kind of take the flap and lift. Now you notice there's nice moisture in the peat moss. Depending on where you buy it, that may not, that may not be the case. Some people choose to add a wetting agent like the Kuyaha extract or Thermex or homemade. You can uh, take some soap nuts and get it all soapy in the water and use that. Or you can just slow water and use your hands. Either way, you don't want the peat moss to be hydrophobic where it really repels water, but the compost should be wet. And by the time we're done, we're gonna add water to everything. So if you really want to, you could add water straight to this I think it's a little overkill. I used to do that and I think it's plenty of moisture in this one. So I'm just gonna lay it out and get going and eventually I'll add moisture to the whole thing at the end and we'll talk about that. But right now, like, it's so compressed. That doesn't help me. So I'm gonna start to break this up and then I rub it together like that so that it all just falls apart. And I don't need to do it perfect, but I wanna get started on this. Some people will go around and smash them with their shoes on and some people will hit it with a shovel. I'm just gonna get the big ones like this real quick. A lot of times the edges get really hard packed where the center is pretty nice, but it gets a little drier on the edges. And so if yours is really dry, it might be better to add some moisture before you start breaking it up. It might make it easier. Either way, just gotta get the job done. Now, I'm not gonna get it perfect, but I wanted to show you the process and I'm gonna be looking for clumps the whole time. And we're gonna be making this soil over a couple days. I'm gonna moisten it, let it come to life. As I remix it, I'll look for clumps. Kind of the, the zen way. I don't have to do, sit here and just spend two hours doing it. Okay, now I'm just gonna spread it out. Use the shovel to break them up. There we go. So I've made a layer. It doesn't have to be perfectly flat. I just want it to be thinner so it's not entire volcano that I'm trying to amend, right? You can spend a lot more time breaking these clumps, but like I mentioned, I'm gonna do it as I go. Compost I wanna add next so that I create that layer on there. I'm gonna do the Kuoko last so I can show you what it looks like. And then our build-a-soil worm castings. 
If you're using our bags for the first time, you find the part that has the tape strip on it and you go to the right side if you're facing the tape strip and you pull. That removes it. The reason why we use these bags is they'll make it. A lot of times when you use the cheap plastic bags, they just half of them on the tarp, they're already torn. They don't make it in the mail. These you can throw to the pickup truck, they hold. They're super durable, so a lot of people will reuse these. They'll fold them up and they'll store some of their amendments in here or they'll keep the compost and fold it down. Use them as a trash bag at least once to get another use out of them before you throw them away. They're, they're really great, so please reuse them. The black gold, build a soil castings. We got a lot of this to add in here and that's really where a lot of the nutrition comes from. Break up the clods if you want, but they're so moist and nice, they're gonna break up as we just start to mix this five cubic feet. The sixth one is going to be the Kooko. I'm going to spread this out, then I'm going to put the Kooko, and then I'm going to put all of the amendments and minerals so you can see what it looks like. Colorado Worm Company, the homie, the local head stash. He's got a decent amount available, but still not enough where we can go crazy on it. So only one bag of this, and I think it's more than enough. We did an episode with Alex from Colorado Worm Company Castings. We go in a little more detail about his family farm, how it's a homestead family property, historic clean water rights. They have an organic horse sanctuary, if you will, and they make all their own compost and then they turn that into vermicompost. And the whole process is as how Coot would do it. And I think it's really, really cool. It's not exactly the same, but it's a really good casting and Coot has put his blessing on these castings. And so I think that it's only right that we use these ones. You'll notice a little bit difference in color. It's a different feedstock source. Look at that, there's a worm right here. That's the type of stuff that we see in the Colorado Worm Company castings that you see in nothing else, because this is homemade. It's not screened down to the little fine little castings. This is like real thermophilic compost with tons of worms ret retained for like months at a time to make the castings before they're sifted. It's not like some two week process or some one month process. This is old school really good worm castings. And so we like to add one bag. It's super heavy. It helps to hold the moisture. I mean, there's worms. I mean, we're going to have, we're not going to have to add any. This is an entire worm population in here because there's going to be cocoons and worms. This will ramp up into its own life on its own. Not only that, but because this is fresh from the worm bin, when we ship it to you, there's going to be rove beetles, predator mites, the entire consortium that comes from the worm bin is going to be in here. And that gets me really excited. I'm just going to keep mixing. And next is for me to spread these out a little bit, and then I'm gonna add the nutrients, the Clackamas Coot nutrients, and then the minerals. This is peat moss, it's not soil, but what makes soil is weathered rock, ground up rock and some organic matter. And so it seems like adding a lot of rock dust makes a ton of sense when it comes to recreating real soil, but with the characteristics that we require to grow in a container. I hope that makes sense. I'm gonna spread this out a little bit. Try not to be too hard on the couple of worms that are in there. I'm gonna do the minerals. Then I'm gonna put the nutrients on top. Each one of these is already pre-weighed out and it's for nine cubic feet. We're making 18, so we're gonna do two of them. Look at all those minerals, beautiful. Dump it in here and get a little bit dusty. Now I've got the nutrients. Two of these for 18 cubic foot, each one makes nine. The big chunks are karanja seed. The small seed is the malted barley, the green parts. We got the kelp meal. It's everything that we talked about being the Coots recipe, the ocean and the land. I mean, it smells really, really good. It's something that I really like about making your own soil. All these ingredients, you can buy them anywhere, right? But these ones are all up to our standard. So you got karanja that has a little bit of oil content. Sometimes it sticks together a little tiny bit. It's really good seed meal. It's got no heavy metals. It's sustainable. It like, it's a nitrogen fixing tree. Um, it produces an oil product that is used for cooking oil and used to fuel. And like, there's so many good uses to the Pongamia tree, to the Terviva Karanja cake that we offer. Pongamia is another name for the Karanja in India. And they're part of Ayurvedic medicine for thousands of years. So the Neem tree of utmost importance, the Karanja tree, huge. And they both are really good at improving poor soils, fixing nitrogen. And so this isn't something that is just like, harvesting corn and saying it's, you know, green, when the corn might be ruining the soil. This is truly something that's good and that's part of the ingredients that we have in here. Kelp, we only buy from one special company. So everything we research, we're happy to talk about that. If you've got questions, you can post them up in here and we can discuss some of the details. The malted barley is organic, everything top grade. The whole idea is get this stuff in a pile. 
if you're using it in really small containers, it probably should be mixed well. If it's going to be all in one container, it arguably doesn't matter that much. But we do need to get it mixed up so it's somewhat homogenous, gets the texture that we're looking for. Last, what I need to do is I need to add the biochar and I need to add all of the aeration and then I need to start mixing it up. We'll talk about watering and how to get that right. I don't want you to overwater this, it'll go funky on you. So if you're gonna do anything, err on the side of caution. We'll discuss that. I'm gonna add the biochar and then I'll do the aeration last. Nice thing about the pre-charge is it's usually not as dusty because it had that moisture from when we charged it, where the real stuff, when you get it raw, is so dry and just gets in the air, it's crazy. I'm gonna mix this at least once or twice and then I'm gonna start adding the aeration. What if you're somewhere and you're like, you know, they don't have this crustacean meal that you have. Or I can't find kelp meal, or the one that I have is, you know, not the same type of kelp where I'm worried about it. Don't overthink it too much. Food grade stuff is great. Alfalfa is the kelp of the land. And so that's one that people use to replace kelp meal. It's the green portion that we're looking to add. And it has some growth hormones and it has a lot of nutrients in it. That's why they feed it to animals. It has the saponins that we're looking for from as a wetting agent. So alfalfa is a great material and you can mix that in instead of the kelp meal, um, crustacean meal. That's calcium and it's also chitin. And so another form of that would be another chitin product that's ground up insects. You don't have to add that. It could just be the calcium really that's building the soil from nutrients. And so you could leave it out and add a little bit more of the minerals. The neem cake, the karanja cake, those are seed meals. It's a way to add nutrition to the soil and any seed meal would work, but we avoid cotton because it's the most Monsanto GMO sprayed, like it's ridiculous corn, it's GMO sprayed. So I, I just, soy, unless it's, you know, organic, non-GMO. I stay away from those heavies and then they're not gonna be an issue. We use camelina meal, it's a seed meal. We use the karanja. We've got a mustard that we're gonna talk about. There's many things that you can use that's just ground up seed. That's what we're looking to do. Worst case, go buy some beans and grind them up into a flour and have a bean meal. Like, let's get a seed meal in the soil. Don't overthink that, okay? So that's a replacement for this. The malted barley is just a sprouted seed. Barley is easily available because of beer brewers. You could sprout some organic corn. You could sprout some organic popcorn from the grocery store. You could sprout some barley. You could sprout some oats. You could sprout any seed that you have. Sprout it when the tail is about that long, just when it's ripe and plump, before it starts to grow. That's when it's usually at peak enzymatic activity because seed starting is an enzyme-based process. So then we blend those up in water and just dump the water in here. Or you grind them up and throw them as a, as a seed meal. So don't overthink the malted barley. That's all it is, it's sprouted seeds. Uh, next, we have minerals. You might be able to find a rock dust in your area. Heck, on the East Coast, might be granite rock dust. That would be great. On the West Coast, you might find the glacial rock dust or the stuff up from Canada, the basalt. Here in Colorado, I've got basalt right up the street from the Grand Mesa, encapsulated it. We love Montana Grow. That's a silica volcanic rock tuft. It's very clean and heavy metals. Buy the Montana Grow. That's covered in basalt too, on top of that mine. So, Find some volcanic material. Find a granite rock dust. Read Bread from Stones. It's a rock dust book that's free online. Learn about remineralization and you'll see that glaciers either drug the rocks through, volcanoes exploded, but somehow we got minerals in the soil to make fertile soil. That's the idea there. Then the other two in the mineral mix are the gypsum and the oyster. Those are heavy calcium. When you read about soil building, calcium is king. It's very, very important to balance the cations in a real agronomic soil outside. It's high, high calcium and if it's not, it needs to be added calcium too to be full productivity. You can learn about soil testing, read Steve Solomon's The Intelligent Gardener, but really Coot's recipe works. It has enough calcium in it. The only challenge we find is that if you add only the oyster shell flour, not the gypsum, and it has a lot of, bi has a lot of carbon in it, and you happen to use ditch water that has bicarbonate in it or is, a, or is alkaline, it can combine and kind of lock the calcium out. So gypsum might be a better choice for you. At the end of the day, lime is perfect. It's calcium carbonate also. We avoid dolomite lime because it's so much magnesium. It tightens the soil. It's not the correct ratio, but a regular um, high calcium lime, agricultural lime, that would work too. So you don't have to use the oyster shell. And I hope that that helps you understand anywhere in the world how you might source these ingredients. If you've got questions and you're somewhere where you can't find something, drop a comment in here. I think as a community, we can support each other if we've found good resources in our locale. Check out Rock Dust Local. He's got rock dust all over the country. A Little bit more about the Coots recipe. That was a thought. I'm just gonna keep mixing and getting this going, okay? So I like to, once I've mixed it a little, make a pyramid. So it's just gonna flow down and that flowing mixes it. Then I'm gonna spread it out and show you how I use the tarp. I'm gonna spread it back out and I'm gonna flip it back into the middle again.
you can grab the tarp and it just pours it back in the middle. Get a good grip and just whip it. Just go around. Okay, now I don't want to get too crazy. So that's pretty good. Just spread it out, add the pumice rice holes, then do all that a couple more times. Two bags of rice holes, four bags of pumice. That's six cubic feet. Okay, if you get a couple of clumps like this, we get it raw. We've dumped the pumice in the same spot thousands of yards, so it's basically just pumice and a little bit of clay. We're trying to build real soil, so it's fine. And if you notice it's a slightly difference in color, it's all raw and natural. So there's a little bit of moisture in some of it, and some of it's a little bit drier depending on the top of the pile or the middle. We get truckloads of this fresh dropped off almost every single day. It's crazy how much we go through. So that's what the pumice looks like, and they literally pull it out of the ground like this. It's pretty incredible stuff. 18 cubic feet is 135 gallons and I hope you're ready for a little bit of a workout. It's really fun to do, but it takes a bit of effort. And like I said, you don't have to do it in one go. You just dump it out, come back later and mix it, mix it again and again. Don't be too hard on yourself, but it's really rewarding. And I feel like when you get your hands in there and you break up the clumps, you make the soil, not only do you have better results, but you have a better connection with your garden. You're willing to commit because you made it. And I think you're going to make it through whatever challenges you face. In life, I've noticed that when things are given for free, oftentimes they're disregarded or they're not appreciated. And when you earn this, you understand it, you understand the ingredients, you appreciate it, and I think it gives you a better go at organic growing in living soil. So take that for what it's worth, but a lot of people that make their own soil, they feel the same way. I'm gonna grab my shovel and mix it. And then last, we're gonna talk about adding the moisture and letting it all come together. This is starting to look like a soil. It's still really rough around the edges. We've got a lot more mixing to do, but it's starting to look like something now. You see how when you walk it with the tarp, it flips the very bottom over. That gets it all turned over. It's really nice. We've got a little bit more mixing to do. And then I'm going to add some water. Let it come together. We'll let it sit for a day or two. Then we're going to mix it again. So this video will be done over a couple days. Okay, so it's been one day since I initially mixed the soil together for the Coots recipe. I've got it here in the tarp. And this is what I've always done. In my garage, I would mix it on the tarp. I'd wrap the tarp up. What'll happen is it starts to come to life in there. But what we have to do to get it really to that point is add the water, which we didn't do yesterday. We were just getting it mixed together. It's harder to mix it when it's wet. Adding the moisture is super important because that's what brings the biology to life. And there's a couple things. It's similar to making compost in the sense that we're combining carbons and nitrogens and it can actually make it heat up. And when you make compost, you actually have a specific balance. When we're making potting soil, it's not exactly the same because it's more finished, but we did add raw amendments in here, crustacean and kelp, and that will hit the compost and the, the moisture and the biology, and it'll cause a reaction. That energy can create warmth. The good news about the Coots recipe is we're not adding like bone meal and chicken manure and blood meal and all this stuff that causes a huge thermal reaction. So most people have found that the Coots recipe in particular, you can make it and you can plant into it the same day. But there's an agreement between people that build their own soil that when you build a soil from scratch, it's just mixed components the first day. When you get the moisture right and the biology ramps up and it gets a little bit warm and it steams and you mix it a couple times, it turns into a finished product. It homogenizes, we call it. Some people call it cooking because it gets warm, but it's like the water soluble stuff starts to come out with the moisture and it starts to glue together a little bit and the soil profile changes a little bit. Today, what I'm gonna do is get the moisture in there and talk about it, show you what it looks like, and then we're just gonna wrap it back up, put the shovel on, and since the moisture's in there now, it's gonna get together perfect. Just like compost making, if we add too much moisture, the process doesn't happen. In fact, too much moisture could cause your biology to go anaerobic, without air, totally just muddy like soup, and that's when you get a raunchy stench, 
and it won't completely ruin your soil, but it's against what we're trying to do. We're trying to make it happy and alive with aerobic conditions, which means that if we're going to make a mistake today, we need to add too little water, not too much water, because guess what we can do the next day? Add more water again. And the, the ratios that we've always used when watering is about five to 10% by volume. There's 135 gallons in this kit, 18 cubic feet. That means the most I would add today would be 13 gallons, but I'm gonna err on the side of caution. I've got my Chapin water sprayer, it's three and a half gallons. And so if I were to do three of those, that would be 10 and a half gallons, right? One more would take us close to that danger zone. So I'm gonna put two or three Chapins on there of water, and I'm actually gonna put a little bit of the J Plant Speaker Kuyaha, a wetting agent to help make sure the moisture moves through there. And as we get closer, I'll do a little field check and I'll see where we're at with moisture. Then I'm gonna wrap it up, put it away, and then we're gonna come back in a day or two and we're gonna show you what the activity looks like and how it's starting to come alive. And if it is warm, which I don't expect to get too warm, we can turn it one more time, get the middle to the outside, get the outside to the middle. Because if it gets warm in the center, there's this biological activity happening there and the outsides won't get it. So then we fold it to the middle and we let that happen again, just like making compost. As I pulled the tarp away from the pile so that it wasn't wrinkled right around the edges, because when I get my shovel, I don't wanna catch the tarp and rip a hole in it. You look at it, it's mostly mixed. I take a handful, it looks like soil. It's got a decent amount of moisture, but there's like a little pocket of peat right there. I can see the minerals and nutrients, but it's not perfect, it needs more mixing. I've got a couple clods like this, which will break up. See how these clods roll out? It literally filters them out for you when you make a pile and the big ones fall. But I just go like this, smash them, right? You can use your hands, but if you do that, and you do it a few times, as you turn this each time, let's say you turn it four or five times, the big clumps will fall down and you'll eventually get them all. I need to get the moisture in there. Instead of me just mixing this five times with no moisture, so what I'm gonna do is put a whole can on, three and a half gallons, then I'm gonna mix it all around again. Then I'm gonna put another can on, mix it again, and then I'll decide, does it need any more water? Or are we good where we're at? If I feel like we're good, I'll wrap it back up and that's it. Then the whole thing starts to come to life. Once there's enough moisture in there, all the compost and amendments, it's gonna warm up a bit, grow some mycelium. So we'll show you as it happens. Right now, I'm just gonna grab the water can and get after it. I've got one ingredient to add and I'll tell you how I do it. This is the Kuyaha extract. It's a very high saponin extract from the soap bark. You can use soap nuts, you can use yucca, you can use anything that makes the water a little bit foamy. That way, the water doesn't just rush right through it. Worst case, if you don't have this and you're making your soil today, you don't have a wetting agent, it's okay. Like, it doesn't matter. Just get the water on there. This just makes it easier to do. However, literally taking time to do this, you won't need a wetting agent. It will come together like a sponge as long as you don't overdo it. Just be a little more cautious if you don't have this because some of the water will run out and you'll think you've overwatered, but it's not actually in there. So it might just be slower watering more times if you don't have this. I've got three and a half gallons of water in here. Just clean filtered water, that's it. And this is a 16th of a teaspoon per gallon. So three and a half gallons, let's call it four sixteenths. Well, that's a quarter of a teaspoon. So I'm just gonna throw that in there. If you're gonna shake this, don't do it over your feet. They got a sharp edge and this can release and drop. Even though it's locked, it can twist. So be careful. You can use a hose, whatever, but this is filtered water in here. Plus I've got the wetting agent and I'm just gonna kinda evenly throw the water around here. And if I were to just spray this, it would barely get like the top half inch. This will penetrate a little bit more. Although it doesn't get it perfectly uniform, I'm gonna mix it with the shovel, so it doesn't matter. Once I'm done with this three and a half gallons, I'm gonna get the shovel and mix this again. This is not a lot of moisture for a pile this big, so it'll still be really easy to mix, but I still gotta break up the clods, and I'm gonna add a couple more of these before we're done for the day. And then we'll finish this video when I show you what the pile looks like as it comes to life. Okay, now you notice I didn't add more Q. There was tons of foam in here, so I'm just gonna let it ride. So this is the second chapin that I'm adding. The first one didn't do much, but it's starting to get a little more moisture in here. Totaling seven gallons so far that we're gonna have put on here. Well, if this is 135, call it 140 gallons. 10% is 14, 5% is seven. So we're at 5% right now with two chapins. That means the most we put is two more, but 5% is usually a pretty good number and there was already decent moisture in here. So this might be it, it might need a little more. 
But once I mix it right now, the moisture will start to come together a little more and I'll, I'll make a decision if we need another one or not. When it's time, I'll do a squeeze test. You can't do a squeeze test right away because the moisture might be in pockets still. So sometimes I'll wait another day. But when you squeeze the soil, if it just runs water down, you've, you've overwatered it. You wanna squeeze it and barely have a drop of water kind of bead through your fingers. Otherwise it's too wet. So if you do the squeeze test right now, there's dry, it's not, there's too wet in some areas, dry in others. I need to get it homogenized first. If you've not done this type of work before and you're not used to working with a shovel, you can really hurt your back. And sometimes you go a little too far before you realize it. I've done this a lot. It's not really an issue, but it might be good to have a buddy here help you out. If you're physically active, fine, but a lot of people grow for medicine and this might be too much work. And that holds a lot of weight. You fill it full, you do it offside your spine a whole bunch of times, you can ruin your day. So just be careful when you're mixing the soil. Just because I'm going crazy with it, go at your own pace, okay? Let's see where we're at as far as moisture. There's no moisture coming out at all. Like none coming out the bottom of my hand. But see how it's clumping a little bit? Not staying together, but almost like some pieces here. We're getting there. We're not at risk of overwatering yet, but this is close, right? See uh, right there, starting to clump. That's kind of what we want. So I'm good to add one more can here, but I'm not gonna add the fourth can. I'll just wait. Mix it just a little bit, wrap it up, and that's it. My last go with this will be the last day where I show you that it's warmed up a little bit, that's activated. We'll show you what it looks like. At that point, I can decide to add more or not. It doesn't have to be perfect. I can put it in my container and add more water later when it's easier, lighter weight to move, right? At that point, I'm gonna mix it one more time. And then I basically scoop it into buckets or whatever and put it in a four by four container. So we're getting really close. Once you start to add moisture, it starts to clump up a little more. And we wanna make sure that these are broken. That was a soil mix clump, but that was a compost clump. But the clumps of compost and stuff, I'd like to break up if I can. Good news about organics is a pocket of peat moss is not gonna kill anything. It's not like chemical fertilizer. Then when I dump it into the four x four bed, I can break it up then too. So we have lots of chances when you're making it from scratch to do that. I'm gonna spread this out and then put one more can of water. I like to go through the center and make two mounds. That way you get the whole middle, the thickest part done, two piles, then you mix them back together. Shuffle the deck, separate two halves, put it back together. You can tell it's got a really nice moisture now. It's not overwatered. It's starting to get to the point where it's holding a little bit of shape there. No water's coming out, so I could add more. I can always do that when I pot it up though, and that's pretty nice texture right there. Look at that, it's holding. That's all I want. That's a good level of moisture. I can add more later. If I add too much now, I can't take it back out. It's gotta dry out. That's it for day two. Tomorrow, in less than 24 hours, like if you're making compost, this will be 140 degrees tomorrow. With soil and the Coots recipe, this will probably be 90 degrees, 100 degrees, right in the dead center tomorrow, since the moisture's right and it's a thick pile. Tomorrow I'm gonna show you that. And if it does get warm, I'll mention it. We'll show you if there's any mycelial growth. Then I'm gonna break it down if it is warm and take the outside to the inside, cover it back up. At that point, some people let it sit here for one to two weeks. It's up to you. I'm gonna get it in its final container, waiting until we're ready to transplant. We're gonna let it sit here and we'll be back tomorrow. Okay, we're back again. It's been one more day since you last saw us mixing the soil and yesterday we added the moisture. So now the soil is basically done and ready. I wanna unwrap it right now. I wanna see if it's warm. I wanna see what the moisture looks like. And then that's gonna wrap this video up because if it's where I want it to be, there's only a couple choices you can make from here. One, you can immediately start using the soil, it's fine. Two, you can let it sit for a week or two. It might ramp up just a little more in temperature and then cool off. You can mix it a couple more times, but all of that is kind of extra work and it's not 100% necessary. So as far as instruction goes, if you're watching this to learn how to make your own soil, to build a soil from scratch, you'll be done at this point. If you'd like to watch the rest of the series, see what we do with the soil, watch us load it up into the four x four grassroots fabric planter bed that we're gonna use, then you can follow along and we're gonna document that as we move it, we'll show us how we move it, the whole deal. So let me unwrap it, let's take a look at it and we'll wrap this up. It looks really good, tiny bit of drier around the side, so I'll probably mix it one more time and call it a day. Oh wow, it's already warm, that's really nice. I'd say right on the surface here, it's probably 90 degrees, maybe 95 degrees, because it feels very close to my body temperature. It's about the same all the way through, that's really nice. One of the things about the coot recipe, it doesn't heat up super hot. Some of the recipes would be thermal by now, or be like over 130 degrees and steaming, and see how that cavity is staying perfect? 
that means we got the moisture right. I mean, I can dig a hole out of there and it really makes a cave, which means that it's actually holding a shape. That's what we're talking about. And now the moisture has really come together and evenly spread throughout the soil. While there might be a couple dry edges there, this is so nice that if I flip this one more time and wrap it up, it's done. I can let it sit. I don't think it's gonna go too much warmer. And that's one of the benefits of the Coots recipe, but it did get a little bit of warmth. It really has ramped up. And the, the microbes that are in there do that as they start to break down the material that's in here. I could talk all day about building soil, but this video is to show you the process, talk about the ingredients and honor Clackamas Coots and his recipe and how simple it is. He has a reason for every single ingredient, kelp meal, crustacean meal, the neem cake, the karanja cake. All these are important for very specific reason and they've been used for thousands of years. That's why this recipe is so important is it's not just some fad ingredient or ditching something because we heard of the newest test that has to happen, right? If you're a home grower, let's go with what's worked for thousands of years. I'm gonna spin this one more time and we're gonna wrap it up. Get weird on it, have fun, make your own soil. Get your hands in there and I really feel like you're going to feel more connected. And we've talked about that, but it's like making a meal for your family or friends and then getting to break bread with them. It's better than just ordering takeout. There's a really big difference there. So I'm gonna spin this one more time just to make sure that all the moisture is even. I'm gonna wrap it back up. We're gonna let it sit a couple of days because the weekend's coming. And then next week, we're gonna record another episode for the YouTube series where, where we actually cut the PVC pipes and build our four x four bed. And we're gonna dump it in. We're gonna fill that entire four x four bed. And we're gonna grow Coots Genetics, the Pakalolo, the one from Coot, in Coot soil, in a massive amount of it, which I think is pretty epic. And we'll be answering questions as we go. The most important part of this is, now that you've made the soil, how do you use it? And so if you follow along, we're gonna show us putting it in there, then we're gonna put the cover crop in it, we're gonna bring it to life, and we're gonna transplant into it, and we're gonna show you what the plants look like when you're using a soil like this. And because of the volume we're, we're using, we're gonna be printing out our new 2022 Build a Soil feed schedule. A lot of you ask detailed questions about what should I add and when? and we made it so that it's water only and how to do that. And one of the ways is larger soil volume. And we also have a number of different tips for supplementing if you really want to, or if you feel like you have to. So look out for that. You can download it and reference that. Thanks for watching. If you've got questions, put them in here. If you've got a comment, drop it. Hit the like button, it really helps. Subscribe, tell your friends, and I'll see you guys on the next episode.